All right. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. Thanks for um, coming today. Um, I'm going to introduce myself in a minute. Before that, I also want to introduce Allison and Anna, um, who are here with me today as my TAs. Um, I won't be able to necessarily juggle presenting and looking at the chat. So Allison and Anna are going to, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, um, they can help alert me or they can try to answer the questions as well. Yeah, so <clears throat> just wanna say that. So welcome to the Precision Health Bootcamp for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Uh, my name is Dr. Alexander Weber. Uh, I've been an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and a staff scientist at BC Children's uh, Research since the summer of 2019. Uh, so this marks three years now for me. Uh, my research focus is on applying state-of-the-art MRI methods and analyses to investigate uh, neonatal brain health and development. So I'm taking over for Lynn Williams today, um, who is a computational neuroscientist, an incredible data scientist at BC Children's MRI Research Facility. Um, Lynn had a bike accident, so she couldn't present, uh, and I was asked to take over. and. Um, so I hope these are some good presentations that I managed to whip up. Um, so I have some experience with fMRI data analysis, but in no way am I an expert. I think the field is quite gargantuan. Um, there's a lot to know and learn, and uh, there's, the field is always, you know, critically reevaluating itself and trying to be better, which is good science, I imagine. Um, so, so these are some of my Bonafides on the right here. Um, this is just some research I've published as primary author or senior author um, where I've done fMRI analysis. But I wanted to just highlight um, some other people I know that are probably uh, better experts than myself. So Todd Woodward and uh, uh, Dr. Tamara Vanderwall at BC Children's. Um, they are great people, um, and if you have questions, I think that they may even be better uh, suited to answer them than myself, or if you're interested in collaborating, all that stuff. Uh, so now that we have some of that preamble and uh, bona fides out of the way, this is the overview of what I'm going to be doing uh, for this session. Um, so first, we're going to do some housekeeping, um, which we're currently involved in. I'm going to be giving an fMRI overview. Uh, we'll go over our learning objectives. Uh, I will try to cover MRI physics in an intuitive way. Uh, there's a lot when it comes to MRIs, uh, so I will almost certainly fail. Um, and then we're going to talk about something called the bold effect, which is really important for fMRI. Uh, and then we'll do some fMRI, or we'll talk about fMRI acquisition analysis. That should take us about half an hour. And... Um, or maybe an hour, and then uh, then we'll do the some sockeye tutorial stuff. Um, so it's gonna be fun. So I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. As well, these lectures and tutorials are being shared under the Creative Commons Share Alike 4.0 International. So that means you are free to share, copy, and redistribute the material in any medium or format, and adapt, remix, transform, and build upon the material for any purpose. For more information, you can visit this link. These slides uh, will be available, so um, yeah. So we're gonna do just a kind of a quick overview here. Um, we're gonna start with some basic MRIs, or basics of MRI. So the bottom left here, uh, we have a picture of an MRI scanner. I couldn't get a good picture of the scanner we have at BC Children's uh, for research, but they all look pretty much the same. Although the one at BC Children's is made to look up like a castle for kids, it's very cute. Uh, in the top left, we have a schematic of the components of an MRI. Uh, there's a giant magnet you will not be surprised by. Large gradient coils, um, which are uh, generally used to get uh, the 3D spatial information because um, otherwise it would just look like a big blob. 
uh, a radio frequency coil, which we'll talk more about, and of course, our participant. Um, so we're going to kind of start by breaking down what MRI stands for. Uh, M is for magnet. We have a large magnet that can typically range um, from anywhere between 1.5 to 10 Tesla in humans. Although uh, nowadays there's been um, an incredible explosion in the field of kind of uh, low field MRI, um, which I think clinically and research wise uh, will really shake things up. Um, but for reference, what does 1.5 Tesla or three Tesla mean? Uh, Earth's magnetic field is 0 0.00005 Tesla. So the BC Children's Research MRI, for instance, is 3T, which means it's about 60,000 times uh, as strong. Uh, R is for resonance. Um, so we're going to cover resonance a lot um, at the beginning. Um, this is a really important concept. So MRIs use radio waves with frequencies um, that are the same resonance of the atomic nuclei that we're interested in, which is typically hydrogen. Um, and we use that radio frequency at, uh, in order to manipulate and detect our signal. And then imaging. Well, when we receive a radio frequency back, we obtain it in terms of spatial and phase frequencies or information that we then convert to an image. And we use a Fourier transform for that. All right. So fMRI, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so um, yeah, so this session, we're going to be focusing on functional MRI. Um, we're going to try to explain the physics and the physiology um, that allow for fMRI. But for now, let's just go over, uh, hello, an overview of what's involved. Um, so in order to perform the most appropriate fMRI study, uh, either task-based or resting state, uh, a researcher researcher clinician needs to understand its main application field. So you definitely want to uh, start uh, by knowing what you want to do in order to begin. Um, and then um, there's some hemodynamic characteristics that are going to be important to know about and how best to test what you're looking for. So you can do resting state and then within task based, there's a lot of different uh, types. I'm not going to be talking too much about that because today we're mostly just going to be covering pre-processing. Um, and then, um, you know, it's important to know the most appropriate acquisition type. It's good to know all about uh, all the artifacts that you want to avoid. And if you can't avoid them, how to best um, correct for them. Uh, then, Quality control. There's a whole bunch of different analysis methods um, and pre-processing, and then statistics. So uh, there's a lot to get into. So for the lecture today, we're going to be going over the physics. I said the brain physiology, fMRI acquisition. We'll talk a little bit about task and resting state fMRI. And then for the tutorial, um, I'm going to show uh, everything from after we've scanned how to get your data from the PAC system if you are at BC Children's doing MRI research. Um, but if you aren't, I mean, it's gonna be a similar um, situation. Uh, wherever you get your data, you need to uh, grab it from the scanner. Um, I'll show how to copy it over to Sakai, and then we'll go into converting raw, let's say DICOM for GE or PARSREC for Philips. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about bids BIDS is its own uh, tutorial, unfortunately, um, but it's a standardized way of organizing your data. And then we'll go into the pre-processing using something called fMRI prep. Uh, there's a lot of steps for pre-processing and I could have shown them all separately, um, but there's been a move recently within fMRI to sort of have everyone kind of pre-processing their data in a standardized way because there's so many um, variables that if you pre-process your data differently, you can come up with completely different end results. And um, if I have time, I'll show you how to do some nuisance regression. So for learning objectives, um, at the end of the session, students uh, 
will be able to, or hopefully will be able to, describe how MRI is produced and detects signal from the body, describe how brain activity can alter fMRI signals, describe the difference between task and resting state fMRI, and then we'll talk, uh, and then students should be able to know how to download data from open resource. Um, so I won't just show from the PAC system, I'm gonna give you an example of downloading data from an uh, online repository. So that even after the session, if you are not a researcher or a, uh, you know, have access to MRI data, you can get on, uh, online MRI data to play with. And then we will show, oh yes. Oh yeah, yes. And the also has a lot of MRI data and they develop a tool set called FSL to analyzing MRI. So today's workshop, we are going to talk about that. Um, we'll turn, we're going to talk a little bit about FSL. There's also AFNI. There's also ANTS. There's a lot of um, uh, tools, uh, but no, I won't. This won't be a FSL tutorial. Okay. Um, luckily, uh, FSL on their website, yeah. they do have a tutorial okay. and they even, I believe, have data that you download and then you can go through a walkthrough. Okay. Um, so if you haven't uh, had that opportunity, uh, I can hopefully show that link and kind of show that. I think AFNI has the same thing. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. FSL is definitely uh, an incredible workhorse. Um, I am mostly familiar with FSL. Okay. Although when I did my PhD, I uh, worked with AFNI a lot. They're both incredible tools and they have their pros and cons. And fMRI prep is, you know, uses some parts of FSL, some parts of AFNI, some parts of SPM, some parts of FreeSurfer, some parts of ANTS. Okay. Yeah. It's, it could be a lot to uh, to try to know and understand and uh, and use. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, right. Okay, so um, let's jump into it. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna go back and we're gonna focus on this concept of resonance. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna be saying isn't exactly true um, because if it if I were to try to give the best uh, to uh, lecture on what we know to be true, it would be a lot of quantum mechanical uh, confusing stuff. Um, so for the purposes of maybe in creating some in, some deep understanding or uh, the feeling of deeper understanding, let's say, um, this is going to be a, a more of an intuitive understanding of what's going on. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I won't be able to do superpositions and stuff. So yeah, so the basic physics of MRI resonance, um, you can look at the Earth. Uh, the Earth is, you know, spinning um, along the, the poles and it spins once uh, in 24 hours. And uh, however, it's also spinning on another axis and I didn't realize this, but that rotates once every 26,000 years, um, which is really slow. So this uh, secondary rotation is what's called um, precession. So now a better example might be a gyroscope. I don't have a gyroscope here with me to demonstrate this, um, but if you've ever played with a gyroscope, you know that you can, you can have it spinning straight up, uh, but you can also have it kind of rotating uh, like this, as well as spinning on its own axis. So this is the precession part. So in MRI, we use a big and powerful magnet. So is this, is this blocked for other people when I have it like no, this? No, no. Okay, okay, sorry, got it, got it. Um, so yeah, in MRI, we use a big and powerful magnet uh, to manipulate the precession of hydrogen atoms, uh, which are mostly from water. And where does a hydrogen's atoms precession come from? So for a hydrogen atom, which is in a water molecule is a proton and a shared electron, the proton has a property known as intrinsic angular momentum or spin, quantum mechanical spin. Uh, for our purposes, we can imagine that the proton spins around an axis. This is not the case. No one actually knows what <laughs> quantum mechanical spin is. Uh, it just seems to be an inherent property that we know about. Um, yeah. But for our purposes, we're going to imagine that uh, a proton is spinning. And so because a proton has a charge, it is positive. 
and a spin, it is therefore a moving charge. And if you remember your high school physics, electromagnetism is such that if we have a moving charge, we also have a magnetic field. So when hydrogen atoms are, uh, or if they're not placed in a magnet, they're kind of, they're, um, the orientation of their magnetic field is all over the place. But when we place them in a large uh, magnetic field, they're going to line up. Um, some are going to face up, so let's call them spin up, and some are going to face down, let's call those spin down. Um, and at the same time, each hydrogen atom is going to be rotating uh, around the main magnetic field, so that precession again, um, which we'll show with just this red arrow. So we're going to use these red arrows to represent the hydrogen's axis. As I said before, some protons are facing up and some others down. Um, they're going to effectively cancel each other out. Um, so then in B, uh, there's still going to be some uh, at a different energy level that are going to predominate. And so out of um, so many, 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 many of these are going to cancel out, but we are still left with a little bit of signal. Um, and this is the ones that uh, there's set sort of a net uh, um, negative or magnetic magnetization. So uh, this magnetic field is known as the longitudinal magnetization, which is going to be parallel with the main magnetic field. And so it's this yellow uh, arrow here. So if we give a radio frequency pulse at the same precessional frequency, this is why precession resonance, this is so important. This is this key concept. If we hit it with the same frequency that it's spinning, which in a 3T scanner is going to be about 128 uh, megahertz, we can target them and put them in line or in phase. Um, so instead of all of them precessing sort of willy-nilly um, at the same frequency, they are now going to be lined up in the same phase, um, spinning in synchrony. Um, however, when we do this, this also uh, reduces our longitudinal magnetization, magnetization to zero. So instead of having a net um, amount of them still in one energy level, they are now going to be in essentially um, an equal amount, so it cancels out longitudinally. So in phase, we now have transverse magnetization, and we've lost our longitudinal magnetization. So here again is an overview, um, but oh yeah, of what happens when we hit our protons with a radio frequency pulse of the same frequency that they're precessing at. Generally, um, we are eliminating our longitudinal magnetization and we're left with this transverse magnetization. So these in-phase precessing protons ultimately create current uh, that we can measure with another coil. Uh, thanks to Faraday's law of induction. So a moving um, magnetic field will create a current that we can measure. Okay, so I want to pause here because uh, there's a lot to take in. But protons have this quantum mechanical spin when placed in a large magnet. These protons precess around the large magnet. Some face up, some face down. Uh, most cancel each other out, but we're left with the, the a little bit left, that's called the longitudinal magnetization. If we give it an RF pulse uh, with the same frequency, we can put these protons in phase and equal out the up and down spins and we create a transverse mag magnetic field and destroy the longitudinal one. This transverse magnetic field is one that we can measure uh, using, using Faraday's law of induction. So I'm gonna simplify things again and we're just going to be discussing the transverse magnetization. Um, because I'm going to eventually lead into fMRI and transverse is going to be the most important one for us. So over time, after we've applied our radio frequency pulse um, and we let it go, the precessing uh, hydrogen atoms are naturally going to start to get out of phase. Um, they're no longer going to be synchronized. Uh, the D phasing in fMRI scans is due to two factors. So one of them is uh, T2 relaxation. This is also known as spin-spin decay. It's a time measure of the rate of decay caused by spin-spin interactions. Although um, 
Lara and John uh, recently presented a paper about how, again, this is an oversimplification, um, but for now I'm going to stick with tradition. Um, so essentially, uh, pro spinning protons interacting uh, and they make each other move faster or slower and therefore they start to become out of phase. Um, so this uh, graph right here is just a representation of how we start with a, a strong trans, uh, transverse magnetization and as they start to dephase, we start to lose that signal exponentially. So in pure water, protons move too fast for spin-spin interaction to dephase each other uh, efficiently. Um, but in fatty tissues like white matter, protons around the macromolecules will spin slower and will have a large effect on the free-floating hydrogen atoms around them, resulting in uh, very intense spin-spin interactions and uh, more efficient dephasing. So ultimately, if we have a T two-weighted brain image, in this case, this is an axial slice. Uh, water is going to appear very bright. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, water is going to appear very bright because it hasn't been defaced. So here you can see that in ventricles, very bright water. Um, in fatty tissue, such as white matter, um, as I said, dephasing happens more quickly. So um, we lose a lot of signal. That's why it's going to appear dark. However, in fMRI scans, um, we do something called T2 star weighting. And there's this uh, additional component, uh, T2 prime, uh, that results in, or in addition to D T2, which will result in T2 star decay. Um, so one of those is the one I've already mentioned, the spin-spin interactions. And the other one is due to static field inhomogeneities. So this is further, further dephasing caused by magnetic field inhomogeneities. And for our purposes, I'm going to discuss one such source of this, and it's going to be magnetic susceptibility effects. So essentially atoms with uh, unpaired electrons create large susceptibility effects. And so all that means is that it distorts the magnetic field. One such example, which is gonna tie beautifully in with fMRI is oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood. In oxygenated blood, the iron particles uh, have all their electrons paired up, uh, creating very little magnetic susceptibility. However, in deoxygenated blood, the iron particles have uh, four unpaired electrons, creating a very large paramagnetic susceptibility, which acts to uh, further dephase um, these uh, water molecules. So essentially, sorry, just a recap. So essentially, highly oxygenated blood is not going to uh, dephase their signal as much as deoxygenated blood. So we're going to pause there on the MRI physics in order to talk brain physiology. So in order to understand fMRI, we are going to need to understand things about the brain. One, one concept we're going to need to understand is something called neurovascular coupling. The basic idea refers to the relationship between local neuronal activity, so neurons firing, and subsequent changes in cerebral blood flow. Uh, the significance of which can be visualized with this picture of the cerebral vascular system. Just an incredible picture. Um, so if we consider a single neuron firing up here at the top, uh, we've got neural activation. What happens after this event? Okay, well, neurotransmitters were going to be released. ATP is going to be consumed, as well as oxygen and glucose. Since the neuron has used up some oxygen and glucose, the supply of oxygen and glucose needs to be replaced. The supply of these molecules is maintained by cerebral blood flow. So there's a weird quirk uh, in our brains, which uh, we take advantage of for fMRI. So the relative increase of cerebral blood flow is about equal to the magnitude of the glucose consumption. So it's almost like a one-to-one -one replacement. The amount of glucose that is used up the brain changes the uh, cerebral blood flow and essentially gets the same amount back. However, oxygen consumption increases much less than the amount of oxygen that um, 
is regained from cerebral, the cerebral blood flow increase, leading to a net increase in the amount of oxygen present. So to put this another way, the brain responds to a loss of oxygen by over-delivering oxygen afterwards. Uh, sorry, the so oversupply of oxygen due to the mismatch between uh, cerebral blood flow and oxygen consumption is the basis of what's called the blood oxygen level dependent fMRI signal. And we'll talk about that in a second, which detects alterations in levels of deoxygenated hemoglobin and cerebral blood volume. So I won't go over the exact mechanisms um, that result in neurovascular coupling, uh, as I'm not sure anyone is exactly sure themselves researching this topic. But essentially through astrocytes and secondary signaling pathways, um, sorry, neural activation eventually results in vessel dilation and overabundance of oxygen. Here again is this basic idea, um, although it doesn't look so basic, of neurovascular coupling. We have this over-oxygenated blood um, and it's going to result in a brighter signal um, than before the neural activation. So if we can compare activated versus non-activated uh, brain areas, we're gonna end up with an fMRI image. Okay, so I know that that part about the brain um, and neurovascular coupling uh, is a lot. So I just wanna summarize it again here. Um, so under normal conditions, oxygenated hemoglobin is converted to deoxygenated hemoglobin within the capillary bed at a constant rate. Um, when neurons become active, the vascular system supplies more oxygen uh, than is needed via an overcompensatory blood flow. The result is a net decrease in deoxygenated hemoglobin and a corresponding decrease loss and signal loss due to T3 star effects. There's a lot of double negatives there. Teaching double negatives is not a great way to learn. Um, but the important thing here is that um, if we have an overabundance of oxygen, we're gonna have brighter signal. And if we, um, so in areas of the brain that are activated, um, we are going to see brighter signal in our fMRI. That's what you need to remember. Yeah. And we mentioned that once we have, I mean, we have the image of the brain, water provides brighter uh, signal, and oxygen also provides brighter signal. So, but once we see a brighter region in the brain, how do we know it's a kind of word of blood or other fluid, or it's because of the, the, the activation of the neuron and the oxygen and carbon dioxide? Well, so there's definitely. Um... There, there, yeah, there's lots of things that can actually contribute to this uh, signal difference. And so uh, a lot of what the pre-processing is going to be and a little bit afterwards is going to be trying to um, identify what's coming from only um, uh, neural activation versus what could be caused by motion, what could be caused by cardiovascular, um, like just your heart uh, perfusion and, and stuff like that. Uh, breathing, blinking, um, yeah. So. A large part of how, when we get our raw data to when we um, want to do our, our analysis is going to be uh, trying to eliminate a lot of that uh, nuisance okay. signal. So some of, there are some of the to explain this kind of different activities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I mean, yeah, fMRI definitely has uh, its detractors, which say that you know this isn't a direct measurement of uh, brain activity and that's absolutely a fair um criticism uh but it's one of the best ways so and i mean there are other techniques there's uh, arterial spin labeling um functional imaging which i haven't done but it seems very fascinating um and uh i think you can use the phase information to sort of help there. Also, there's multi-echo um, fMRI, which really helps to eliminate a lot of these nuisance for um, signal. But we don't have enough time today to cover all that so stuff. The main, the main thing, the main thing that we're measuring is oxygenated blood in regions. Yeah, and that is your. It's our surrogate. Surrogate for uh, activity. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, but things like the other electrical signals and things that firing in the brain, that's not something 
Not with fMRI, no. Uh, EEG, MEG, um, yeah. So here's a chart showing the relative levels of both oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin on the left. And on the right is the change in signal that we detect. Um, so sort of um, canceling each other out, uh, you get the one on the right. So this is called the hemodynamic response function, which essentially just means this is the response of the brain after neuro neuronal activity. So as you can see, uh, we start at time zero um, and we have neural activ activation and it isn't until seconds later that we actually detect signal. Uh, so there's quite a delay there. I also wanna know here, historically, um, this shape on the right has been assumed when it comes to um, trying to de uh, detect signal over all the noise. Um, but in every person's brain and different brain regions and different tasks, uh, this shape is actually gonna be very different. Uh, so this should not be assumed. Todd Woodward, someone at BC Children's is definitely a pioneer in this area and I think he's doing great stuff. Um, so you say the shape should be assumed it's not gonna be mostly normal looking with the- Yeah, okay. yeah, there's, yeah. Actually Todd um, measures it and shows it for different tasks and stuff and it's really cool. But there's always the corresponding kind of increase and slight dip. Yeah, there should be, yeah. Um, Why wouldn't it be symmetric with the decreased deoxygenated hemoglobin and the increased oxygenated hemoglobin? Like why wouldn't those be mirror images? Uh, I think it just has to do with consumption and um, uh, there's probably a whole bunch of effects there that I, I couldn't tell you about. Um, it's a good question. So now that we understand a little bit more about how MRIs work and how brain activity can result in an MRI signal that we can detect, what's called the bold effect, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how we acquire fMRI images. Uh, so on the top here, I have a simplified pulse sequence. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go too much into pulse sequences because they're that can, that's a very complicated topic as well. Um, but because we wanna have a high temporal resolution, which means we wanna be able to detect, um, you know, these fMRI signals um, at a fast rate, uh, we need a fast way of acquiring our data. And so one of the most popular workhorses for this in MRI is called echoplanar imaging. And it's essentially acquiring uh, an entire slice um, of the brain uh, with one radio frequency pulse. Um, so on the bottom here is a single slice of uh, K-space. So K-space is um, a tricky concept to get your head around, but it, it uh, is essentially spatial phase and frequency encoding values. And so we can convert it to an image of signal magnitude and Cartesian coordinates. Um, using an inverse Fourier transform to get um, an image. So unlike a photograph in which the entire picture is taken in a single moment, an, an fMRI volume is acquired in slices and each of these slices takes time to acquire from tens to hundreds of milliseconds. And so one entire image of the whole brain requires um, several seconds because you need to acquire all these slices. So in that case, our sampling rate, if it was, if we got a whole volume every two seconds, our sampling rate would be one volume every two seconds. Typically, fMRI scans are about five to 10 minutes long. So for a five minute scan with two second sampling rate, we end up with 150 volumes, so 150 mm -hmm. time points. Um, and the spatial resolution is oftentimes on in around two by two by two millimeters. Um, which you can see on the left is a pretty um, low resolution image. Um, so here again is a full fMRI volume. This is a sagittal, coronal, and axial slice. Um, so the spatial resolution uh, looks pretty, makes it look pretty pixelated. Um, and so we, we kind of have, uh, relatively low temporal resolution and relatively low spatial resolution. These are definitely 
um, you know, uh, limitations of fMRI. But on the bottom here, I just wanted to show you uh, what, it what the time series looks like of a single uh, voxel, and a voxel is a 3D pixel. And so this is the signal amplitude that we're recording over time for this, this specific uh, voxel. So when you, when you talk about the different, you know, we've got a, we've got a 3T MRI in PC children, you said it goes to 10. Yeah. Does that change the resolution that you would get? Or uh, is the resolution pretty fixed across MRI? Uh, I mean, you can definitely, I mean, uh, on our 3T uh, children's, we can get like 0.6 uh, second TR, which is quite good. Um, a lot of that has to do with parallel imaging, like using, like acquiring those slices uh, simultaneously. Uh, I feel like you can get faster with a uh, higher magnetic strength, but I, um, there's also a lot of, um, there's a lot of distortions that also come with that higher field strength. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think at least for a spatial resolution, you're going to be going to a, a higher uh, field strength. Um, I don't know how low they've gotten with temporal resolution. The thing is, though, there may, because we're looking at that chemodynamic effect, it kind of gets blurred. And it, there's kind of a debate about whether or not getting much higher temporal resolution in fMRI will, will gain you much. Um, yeah. So, okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about task-based versus um, resting state F fMRI, uh, just to give a idea of the, the differences, but I, I won't go too much into it. Um, so here we're talking about task-based fMRI. And uh, the general idea is that you need to be recording the brain uh, doing nothing <laughs> and also the brain doing the task that you're interested in. Um, and so this is a block design. This is a very uh, simple design. This is definitely how fMRI experiments started. It's not necessarily the best uh, way to do it now, but it's very, it's, it gives you a good idea. So um, a neural response, uh, to the state changes from A to B in the stimulus, and that's accompanied by um, a hemodynamic response uh, that is detected by the rapid and continuous acquisition of MR slices, or sorry, images sensitized to both signal. So using single and multivariate time series analysis methods, the average signal difference between these two states can be computed um, in a contrast map generated. And then a statistical activation map can finally be created over here. Uh, using a suitable threshold. So when we look at an fMRI image, um, the, the black and white here is just a underlay. The activation, the statistical information here is red and yellow. Um, so it's just that it's a statistical uh, representation of what it, you know, what we think is most likely uh, activation from that task. So that's just something to to keep in mind. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, no, no, no. And then this kind of five MRI is generally a linear phase A and a phase B. So if we want to identify the regions that are influenced, we need this kind of A and a B experiment design. So, but for example, if a patient comes to the hospital and generally we want to know uh, the image, the general image of the brain, and just to give one kind of scans. So this kind of one kind of a one time scan, since it, it do, do not have the A and B comparisons, mm -hmm. so you cannot run a high time MRI. Right? Um, well, I'm going to talk about rest. What's something called resting state fMRI? Um, oh, resting state. So even if we got this A and B comparison, we can still get a MRI. Yes. Um, which I'll talk about now. Um, no, no, don't apologize. Um, but I think you do raise a good point that. Um, there's so much uh, noise within an fMRI that I think that if that wasn't the case, um, you know, I think that we could do something more similar to what you're talking about, where all activity, you know, you could look at and be like, oh, look, this part of the brain is more active than another. But I mean, it would still be hard to know what is happening if we, unless we have um, something to compare to, like, like a specific 
thing that they're doing. Okay, but we do have resting state. So for instance, um, you know, if you have, if you're scanning a baby, yeah. you can't really tell them to do a task, although they're, you can get them to watch them. I mean, <laughs> not as well as a, as a, uh, as most adults. Okay, or well, maybe we can, even this way, I mean, even Asian has uh, some follow-up mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. and before the patient get a specific disease, if they have some before disease and after disease, MRI image, then we can use the strategy of MRI to find the functional difference between the before and after disease. Uh, I know, I, I think, I mean, that's definitely done with resting state. So, okay, so let's cover resting state uh, quickly here. Um, so, uh, just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to be talking about a version of resting state where we have a, we look at a specific area of the brain and then we try to look at others there their brain that might be correlated. Oh. So remember when I showed that time series, this yeah. time series, right? And this specific area of the brain, are there other areas of the brain that have a very similar time course that are correlated? So, so for instance, um, so here in yellow, we have its uh, time course. And then here in orange is another area of the brain that seems to be correlated. It goes up when yellow goes up, it goes down when yellow goes down. Um, and so the theory behind resting state fMRI is that are areas of the brain that are correlated, are they functionally connected? Are they forming a network of sorts, a functionally connected network? And then there's also areas of the brain that appear to be uh, uncorrelated, so appear to follow the opposite trajectory. Um, So using uh, resting state fMRI, you can, uh, tip or typically people look at these networks. And so if you had a, let's, you were suggesting the group A healthy, group B that, you know, may have a, some kind of neurological uh, something going on, their networks, you know, at a group level might be different. Thank you. No, absolutely. So resting is looking nothing I mean, right just like like if you come back to your a b yeah right like if i was to say stimulus a or stimulus b i feel like both would have to be some kind of stimulus even if it's like right like staring at a puppy right like i think you'd have to fix something because you know i, I would imagine the mind is just wandering yes staring at a right 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 screen yeah an mri on my shoulder and it's loud and crazy and so this idea of resting yeah. is noisy. For sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there is, so uh, I mentioned Dr. Tamara Vanderwall earlier, and she's really interested in naturalistic viewing conditions. And so typically for resting state fMRI, we've, you know, we've asked people, just close your eyes and think of nothing. Uh, well, you know, it's almost impossible for most people to think of nothing unless you're like a Zen meditative master. Um, and as well, you know, people fall asleep. Uh, so then it's like, okay, well, uh, think of nothing and have your eyes open. Um, typically they might look at a crosshair, for instance. Um, so that's not really a natural way for brains to be at rest. Um, so I wish I had include, included a movie here, but um, so uh, Dr. Vanderwall, she creates these uh, videos that are very, very, um, they're not like necessarily images of people doing things. They're just kind of these shapes that sort of morph and, and, and whatever. And, um, uh, so anyways, that's, that's that question of like, that might be a better, uh, way for, you know, us to measure a resting, a brain at rest. Um, but then there's a question of standardization. Would you get everyone to watch exactly the same type of movie? Yeah. As with science, there are devils in the details, and there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of things when you dig down into it. Okay. So after we've covered, uh, you know, basics of MRI physics, the hemodynamic response function, bold effects, and some fMRI acquisition and analyses, uh, we're now moving on to the main event uh, of today, which is fMRI preprocessing. Uh, as you can see from this chart, there's a lot going on. 
So essentially, I haven't uh, stressed this enough, but I should. fMRI uh, data is very noisy. We have the we have a lot of noise and not a lot of signal. And motion is one of our biggest um, things that, that create some of this noise. So it's really important that we pre-process our data in order to get the best analysis possible. So we wanna try to eliminate this uh, motion uh, nuisance as much as possible. So we can think of pre-processing as cleaning up our image and getting it into the best uh, state possible. So pre-processing uh, doesn't only involve fMRI data, it also involves um, something called T1-weighted anatomical data, at least in adults. Um, I'll talk more about T1 um, data in the next session. Um, but essentially because our fMRI image is such a low resolution, like spatial resolution, uh, we need a nice high resolution uh, anatomical image uh, in order for us to do things such as removing <clears throat> non-brain tissue, um, which is called skull stripping, which is quite the term. Um, spatial normalization. So if we're doing a group analysis, we might want all of our subject brains to kind of be in the same uh, orientation and essentially laid on top of each other. Um, so if we look at one, the area of one person's brain, we're looking at the same area in other people's brains. Um, and, be, okay, this is gonna help us. Um, so yeah, so pre-processing, we're gonna be doing brain extraction or skull stripping, uh, motion correction, so that each volume the person might have moved uh, as we're acquiring that image. So we have to register um, those volumes to each other. Slice timing correction, uh, which is because we've acquired these slices at a different time, it's important for us to correct for that. Uh, something called susceptibility distortion. I didn't talk a lot about this because that's, uh, you know, that would add a lot to our time. Um, but suffice to say, T2 star, um, because of uh, static field inhomogeneities, not just from blood, uh, but also. Um, the scanner itself has a lot of inhomogeneities. Um, air tissue uh, interfaces tend to create a lot of distortion. And so we need to correct for those or try to. And um, yeah, we wanna try to estimate um, signal that's coming from the brain versus signal that's coming from uh, motion or car uh, cardiovascular stuff. And also we wanna do uh, a data quality check. We wanna be able to look at our data and be like, ooh, that wasn't so good. We're like, hey, this one's pretty good. Okay, so I'm gonna stop uh, my presentation here. That's just the lecture portion. Um, and now I will attempt the task of um, doing a live demo. Um, before I do that, does anyone have any questions from um, our Zoom that um, hopefully I haven't been ignoring. All right, seeing none. Um, I'll get... One more question. Um, yes. So we often have these batch effects where it depends if something was taken on. Uh, you know, a single individual could differ from one day mm -hmm. to the next just based on you know, confounds preparation or things like that. Do you have this issue where you know the same person taken on different days that there's like a, a day effect? Like if you took 20 people and you did them on Monday, right? 20 people and you did them on Tuesday, is there a clear Monday to Tuesday signal? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, so like circadian rhythm plays a huge part. Um, caffeine plays a huge part because caffeine is a vasodilator. Um, and even what's interesting is that, um, you know, our, our, um, our bodies tend to like to return to homeostasis. So if somebody drinks coffee and is told suddenly to stop drinking coffee, that can have like a, the opposite effect than you might expect. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things to consider. And so 
sometimes to try to control for those, you try to scan at the same time every day. Um, or as you're saying, Monday to Tuesday or Monday to Friday, I mean, there's stress levels that are different because of the way that uh, our society is structured. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, there, there, there's so much to, to try to consider and control. It's tough. Um, I guess the alternative to that is scan at random times and random days and get enough subjects that that kind of cancels itself out. Okay, so I'm gonna start um, the tutorial portion. Uh, let's get rid of this. So, okay, we can see uh, my terminal on the right here. And this is sort of my notes uh, on the left, but I'm also gonna be um, showing you a lot of the code here. Um, I won't necessarily always run it because it will take a long time um, or I've or already run it. Uh, so uh, first, the first thing I kind of want to show for those who um, might be at PC Children's and wanting to use uh, the, the scanner, I kind of just wanted to show you how you go about uh, getting your data. Um, so, um, so I'm going to connect to the VPN at BC Children's. Um, I just want to show you here. Um, I'm using Global Protect, which I guess is their, you know, what they recommend connecting to their uh, VP. So I put in my username, put in my password. Hopefully this works. Um, so now what I can do is I can head over to the um, the 3T fMRI. I don't know what's called that because the scanner does more than fMRI. Uh, XNAT um, uh, BCCHR. So I log in with my BCCHR credentials and um, I can click on one of my projects. Oh, that's not the one I want. Oh, sorry. I need to read before I just jump into things. Um, I can click on one of the scans. And here we see I've acquired, I mean, it's not obvious uh, because of all these um, acronyms, but this is a, a T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image. This is a spectroscopy scan, which I haven't covered today, um, but that you can use to measure metabolites in the brain. MRIs are like magic. Uh, I'm sorry, I was completely yeah. wondering what's T1 and T2 means that uh, I didn't talk about it in the presentation before, but I didn't quite follow it, but I thought it was so clear. What's the difference between T1 and T2 and why they are stored separately? Yeah, uh, I'm going to cover it more in the next session. Okay. Uh, no, but no, 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 but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, um, they're kind of, the simplest way to describe them is we talked about longitudinal magnet magnetization and transverse magnetization. And those types of magnet magnetizations are um, uh, independent um, components. Um, and so they measure different things. And you can uh, make it such that you get more of a T2 signal than a T1 signal, let's say. And um, the reason we would want to do that is that uh, it creates different tissue contrast. And um, so typically in adults, uh, a T1 image gives the best kind of tissue contrast, um, but T2 data can uh, help in trying to resolve um, some things when you're trying to do more complicated anatomical analysis, like morphology and um, brain folding and stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna talk more about it, uh, it's, it's, it's a great point. Uh, also DTI, which we're going to cover in the next session. Um, and here I have um, some fMRI data, which is in this case resting state. Um, and so when you want to download, uh, you go to download images. You can unselect some if you don't want it, and then you click submit. I'm not going to do it now, and it would uh, download a zip file. So that would be still on my local computer at that point. So I would have downloaded it, let's say in the downloads folder. 
Um, so let's uh, disconnect now from the UBC Children's VPN. Um, do I need to be on the UBC VPN? No. I don't, okay. Um, we can, let's see here. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. So eventually we're gonna secure copy it over to UBC. Uh, if we're remote to do that, we would have to you know, log off the BC Children's VPN, log on to the UBC VPN. Since I'm on UBC, I guess I don't need to connect to the UBC VPN. Um, okay, so I just wanna show again. So for me, if I wanna to connect to Sakai, which obviously was covered in the other sessions, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna uh, connect with my uh, CWL and Sakai arc UBC.ca. So I'm gonna run that. Put in my password. So it has that two-step verification. So I told it to send a push to my phone. I answered, yes, this is me. Okay, so now we're in Sockeye. Um, which is what I'm familiar with. I'm not sure, what's the difference between Sakai and Chinook? Chinook is the data storage. Ah, thank you. So if you had fMRI data, you didn't want to store on that other place, you could copy it all over to Chinook and then easily move it between Sakai and Chinook. Nice, thanks. Nice. Okay, um, so we're now logged into um, Sakai and uh, one of the things we're gonna wanna do if we want to get that data that we downloaded uh, just now, which is in this raw format, this DICOM format, we're gonna want it in both a nifty format, um, which instead of having thousands of DICOM files, we're just gonna have one nifty file. So that makes things easier. As well, we're gonna want it in a folder format and a naming scheme that is going to, um, make it easier for other programs to um, assume a lot uh, and, and read it uh, in such a way that doesn't have to make a lot of guesses. So essentially uh, what I'm talking about is something called the bids format. And it's uh, a simple and intuitive way to organize and describe your neuroimaging and behavioral data. So it, you know, here is an example of take DICOM and it's going to be um, putting it in a, in the subjects, you know, name folder and in an anatomical folder, it's gonna put T1 weighted imaging, let's say. In a functional one, it'll give, it'll put uh, all the fMRI data in a, in a diffusion weighted folder, which we're gonna talk about next session, it'll put data here. So basically it is a standardized way to um, convert and store your data. Um, and it's becoming more and more important as, MRI data analysis is moving towards standardization and things and open science, things like this. So typically if you share your data, people want it, people want your data to be in the bids format um, so that they don't have to make any guesses, so on and so forth. So going from DICOM to bid is just organizational, there's no processing that's happening. It, so you're converting your DICOM to nifty and then you're renaming your nifty and you are and you are putting your nifty files in a specific uh, folder structure. Okay. Yeah. So if you if someone asked for raw data, you would they would accept this nifty structure folder or they would need DICOM? Oh, that's a good question. I think that if they specifically want the raw DICOM, then I think they would ask for it. But most data is shared and stored in nif in the nifty bids format. Okay. And um I was going to say something else, but uh, my brain has blanked on it. Um, I find that, so I, I gave a whole uh, short uh, tutorial on bids, which was an hour long. Um, I find it's not super um, intuitive. Uh, so this website, again, uh, this markdown file is going to be available for the link. Um, but uh, you would go, like for me, a lot of times when I 
need help understanding or naming something, um, I would use this resources, or sorry, this resource. There's a lot here. Yeah, so that's MEG. Uh, and then there's EEG, a lot of cool stuff, but you know, different ways of imaging the brain. Um, okay, so for our tutorial, I'm gonna show you uh, how to, uh, you know, um, create a bids uh, folder structure and uh, how to convert our DICOM uh, data into bids. And that's gonna be the first step before we run something like fMRI prep. Um, so also you may, if you log into Sockeye, uh, your screen may look a little different than mine. I have something called uh, bash it, bash it running, which just kind of, uh, I think makes things look a little nicer um, and has like a color scheme and all that. Um, so don't be alarmed if it doesn't look the same. Um, so we have a project space, um, which I created an alias because I hate typing it all the time. But essentially for me, uh, it's arc project and then um, my username. So for people at home at the Precision Health, what's their project space? Uh, people will have their own allocation if oh. they're going to be working outside the search job. But maybe just to be clear to the people at home, we're not following along. People aren't following along with their own. Right. Command line. We're just watching you. Yeah. 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 Because uh, following along would take way too much time. Yeah. Um, so here I am in my product space. Um, and for anything that I need uh, installed locally, I have this installations folder. I don't know if this is the best practice. Um, so there's going to be some. Python stuff we're going to need to install, and it might be best practice to create a virtual environment to do that, um, or maybe the only way to do it. Um, there's also Conda. I didn't do that here because this is, <laughs> I talked to Phil afterwards, and he recommended I, I do the Conda virtual environment, but uh, I don't think it's, uh, two ways to do the there's two ways to do the same thing. So, okay. Um, if you haven't followed previous uh, sessions, um, when you're on Sockeye, uh, anytime you kind of want to run a program, uh, you're not going to have admin privileges to install it yourself. Um, except for Python, you can install little packages, but typically a lot of software that you want, you're not going to be able to install it yourself. So uh, you're going to have to load modules uh, that hopefully are available. So for our purposes, um, you know, we're going to load uh, the Python module and uh, we're going to load the, the Py and virtual environment. And then we're going to create a virtual environment. I'm going to name it fMRI virtual environment. And then we're going to activate it. Um, and all that is so that I can install this program called DCN to bids. Um, so yeah, we can, we can run these. Uh, I've already created this, so I'm not going to run it, um, but you would type this out and you can name this whatever you want. Um, I can just name it example for this, for our purposes. Oh, this, I can't remember if this takes a long time. <laughs> okay. okay, I won't show it. Um, and then let's say that ran, uh, I could then um, activate my, whatever I named it. Oh, geez, maybe I deleted it. Oh, no, I'm, one second. So just to show you uh, my folder here, um, after I create it, it would create this uh, folder uh, where I told it to create it. And so now I've, now I've activated this virtual environment. So um, to install um, some Python libraries, I'm going to use pip here. So I would do pip install, and then this is dcm to bids. It's pretty much just a Python wrapper uh, that calls other programs. Let's see. This is the Yeah, um, but I mean, it, it can also run on 
par rec, which is what you get at a Phillips scanner. Siemens is a different raw data format. Um, I think it basically calls this uh, program called uh, DCM to NII. Um, and this, a lot of people use this to um, convert uh, raw file formats to nifty. Okay, I'm not going to run this, uh, but let's say you could. Um, then let's go to our scratch space. So I'm going to my scratch space because this is where I'm going to put my data because this is where I want my data to be um, analyzed. Uh, so let's make a new uh, folder, which we're going to call example. It's empty. Um, and so I'm going to run, now that I've loaded, uh, for now that I've installed DCM to bids in my Python virtual environment, I can call it. And um, one of the programs is called DCM to bid scaffold. And all that this does is it sets up uh, this empty directory to now be full of sort of the basic bids um, folder structure. I have a code folder. Derivatives is where anything, um, any processed data is going to go. Source data is going to be raw data. And then in this main folder, I'm also going to have individual folders for each subject. And that's going to be the, um, the, the where the converted nifty folders are going to go. So these are all just placeholders for now. Yeah. Yeah. Scaffold is just creating this bare skeleton of, of stuff. Um, so, uh, so on this terminal, I'm in Sakai. I open a new terminal and back to my local machine. And let's say I had downloaded that zip file. Um, so in order to get it into Sakai, I would, you know, uh, my file that's it. Let's say that's what it was called, and then. Uh, so I'm moving this zip file to uh, my Sakai account. Um, and then I have to tell it where to put it. So let's put it to my scratch space. Uh, let's even put it in that folder. Uh, I'm not going to run this. I don't actually have the zip file. But this is essentially what you would write. Um, same thing kind of here. Um, so uh, let's see, I might have a better example here. So I think I deleted the zip file. Um, but essentially, we would put it in this source data folder. We would put it in its own individual subject folder. And um, after we unzipped it, uh, we're going to have these folders. And these are essentially, um, each folder is a number because that's essentially just the, the number for the scan that we acquired. So um, if we go back to, let's get rid of this one. So if we remember when I was on the PAX uh, system, um, this is the series number, and these are the scans. So in this example, I've only kept 3, 4, 9, and 10. And that's going to be T1, T2, uh, and my two fMRI scans. Okay, So let's keep that in mind. OK, so now that I've got my data here, I now need to create a config file. And so this config file is going to be, is going to allow um, this bids program when I run it to uh, understand what I want it to do. So uh, let's see what it looks like. So um, it's written in this J, like a uh, JavaScript um, language. Oh no, not language, JSON. 
I can't remember what it stands for. Um, but essentially, uh, I'm telling it that uh, after it converts it to nifty, there's the files are going to start. This file is going to start with 003, which is the series number, um, which is what I've told it up here. There's a lot going on. I'm not going to be able to explain everything. But essentially, I tell it, look for the file that is called you know, series three and then a bunch of other stuff. And I want you to put it into anatomy folder, and I want you to name, name it a T1 weighted file. Series four, I want you to put it in the anatomy folder and call it T2 weighted. Series nine, I want you to put in the functional folder uh, under the bold file type. And I want you to also add this into the name. So what is the task? It is rest. What is the direction? Uh, it's anterior, posterior. And um, yeah, and same, same with the second uh, functional scan here. So if you bring up your PAX PNG image, yeah. you're just pretty much coding these things into this JSON? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And the how to for that is probably uh, yeah, the how to uh, I found I found that um, again, like I spent a lot of time um, trying to make sense of that. Uh, I, I don't even think that I'm still 100%. Um, so don't be afraid to uh, spend some time and be confused. <laughs> um, you also, as far as like you know, you can see like the top two descriptions are much lighter than like there's extra yeah oh there. yeah so I imagine this could get it does get it gets yeah bare and the nice thing is that there is another program uh, that we're going to install called bids validator and it's going to tell you if you've done anything wrong it's going to say like whoa i don't know what this is or like i'm expecting this thing but you don't have it so i actually imagine i wrote this and i didn't have this uh this thing called sidecar changes so a sidecar is that for every nifty file it's also going to have another JSON file, which has a lot of like, and so we can tell it some custom things that we might want to include in there. And I bet when I first ran this and didn't have this line, uh, it threw me, when I ran the validator, it threw me an error and it said like, whoa, 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 like you need to tell me what the task name is. And so I am giving it here. Um, okay, so now we are going to run uh, this DCM to bids. Um, we need to load another module before we do that. So let's get all that stuff. So this module right here is the Compute Canada one. Um, what's GCC? It's just like a compiler. General C compiler. General C compiler. Uh, CUDA is something that uh, FSL. Uh, oh, wait, I don't know why I need CUDA here. A CUDA. Oh, okay. And um, so we're loading DCM to NIX. So before I wouldn't be able to run this, but now I can. And let's go back to the uh, main folder. So now I'm going to run DCM to bids. Um, I'm going to give it this directory flag, which is going to tell it where. Uh, to find the raw DICOM files. So say that. I'm going to tell it what to name the subject. Um, in this case, I've already run it and I call the subject AMWRTD01. Say. Um, I tell it where to find the configuration file. So uh, So this is that file, that JSON file I created. Uh, where to put it? I just say put it in the folder I'm currently in. Um, and you may or may not need this depending on if you've already run a nifty conversion. Okay, I'm not gonna run this. This is gonna take a while as well. But after I've run it, this folder will appear. Does it take a lot of resources? Uh, it depends. But uh, like not a lot of, like not parallel, or anything like that. But like this is something you would just run on the command line or you put it in the script? You probably uh, submit it to the scheduler. 
I think you would probably run some of this at home first to see that you're doing everything right. But if you have a lot of subjects and you haven't converted any of them, then it would definitely be something you could you could automate this whole thing for sure. And and we have done that um, recently. Anna uh, did that with the data that we collected a year ago or no six months ago. Um, and so we like ran this huge pipeline um, from start to finish. Does it need to uh, reach the internet for any of these operations or? No. Okay, so you could like do an interactive do sub to get onto a compute node and then? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't shown, I will be showing more Q subs um, later, but right now, I mean, all of this stuff could be written into a Q sub. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I wanna check um, that this is correct. Uh, so here, so I'm going to, I want to run bids validator, but I need to install it. So um, I've made another folder in my installations directory. Um, I then run something called NPM and install bids validator. Everything should run smoothly. Uh, if it doesn't, you might just have a module loaded that you uh, don't want. So you can also, you can always do like module, oh, module purge and start over should work. Um, and so after I've installed it, if I want to run it, uh, if I, if this path isn't in my um, bash path, oh my goodness, what's happening? Oh, if you try to tab on a complete on project, sometimes you might. <laughs> Stay tuned. I wonder if I can, okay. nope. Lesson learned. Don't push tab in the project space. So what we're trying to run is this bids validator. And the way I have it written here is, you know, we run bids validator in the folder I'm currently in. Um, it, this is in my path, so I can, I can just run it. I'm not sure what these errors are. I'm not sure if this is a because it's on soccer or not. So if you get a if you get a um, red text, it's generally like a major error that you need to correct. If it's a orange text, it's more like a warning. So um, I've already played with this, so I'm not getting any errors. Um, but uh, one of the reasons that you're going to get an error is um, there might be a file that it doesn't want. So there's this. Um, hidden file called bids ignore. And so anything that you don't want um, bids to look at, um, you can add to there. So I've just taken something out. Let's run bids validator again. We should get an error this time. So this is just checking your JSON and your yeah. everything lines up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Um, oh, it takes a while. Okay, I'm gonna stop running stuff because it takes so long. We we've got like half an hour left. Um, Yes, you are in the last question. Yeah. And last year, in, the, in your demonstration notes, and the, you showed that you can generally use a module load FSL. I guess that the FSL is already stored in, in the modules. It's not available. But on my software account, once I use a module available, I cannot see FSL. So I ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go over that. Okay, I'm just going to cancel this. Um, so if I had run this, we would have gotten a, a red error, and it would have been like, what is this work directory? I don't like it. And, um, you know, if I want to keep that work directory, I could just do something like, um, so I could just add this work directory to the, my bids ignore file. I'm now telling it, ignore all these files and directories. And that would run bid... bid Bits validator and it would no longer throw that error. Okay, so let's go over some of these commonly used modules because 
you guys at home, if you're doing F, uh, MRI work and you want to do it on sockeye, you're likely to want to use one of you know these um, software packages. So let me get rid of all the modules I've already loaded. Okay, so you were saying, um, so if I try to run Free Surfer, ah, I don't know what that is. Um, and you were saying module avail, you were saying I can't see Free Surfer here, right? Which is correct. So first we have to load the Compute Canada module. Oh, I see. It's kind of Oh, so now if I find the mail again, oh, okay. totally different list of what's available. Oh, okay. And so we've got MATLAB. Um, let's find. You shouldn't see FSL. Right. Oh, okay. But we got Free Surfer there. Um, but yeah, you're right. We don't see FSL. Okay. So, um, but you know, we could load the rest of these. Now we have Free Surfer. Free View is one such packages from. Free surfer, so I can now run this, but that's a GUI. I'm not going to run it. By the way, this Compute Canada uh, package or the environment or modules, is this available outside Canada? Because that way you can run it as can be a skill or other Compute Canada module. The Compute Canada LMOD stack is provided from Compute Canada. Yeah. Um, and that's managed all by like the Sakai systems administrator. Okay. So I would say the short answer, no. no uh, but if you were to be working on a cluster, like a research cluster in the US, yeah. and they wanted to use the Compute Canada stack, yeah. they could get in touch with Compute Canada, and Compute Canada would provide them essentially the recipe to have that LMOD oh, stack, okay. right? It's oh. all just software recipes. Oh, like, okay. what does it rely on? And it's oh. all organized. But for the most part, um, if you had to work like in the cloud, uh, or you had your like you were spinning up a cloud environment for this, you just install FSL with sudo apt get install, right? Oh. Like it, it would be uh, this. This is an HPC problem. Where you yeah, don't, you don't yeah, have root yeah. Because we don't have admin privileges, we can't install. So we need to need to load these uh, modules. Yeah, but for something like um, if you were to work on any of the Compute Canada systems, they would have the same oh. modules. So that makes it easy to switch between Sockeye and Compute. Oh, so I think I forgot to um, show you guys. Um, so after we ran that DC into bids, we got this folder subject ANW um, RTD01, because that's what I told it to name it. And um, now we have these two folders, anatomy and funk. In the anatomy folder, I have a T1 weighted, uh, or two of these files. One is a nifty and one is a, a JSON. So let's see what that JSON looks like. Um, JSON. Okay, so it's gonna tell me a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, it's gonna tell me what the scanner strength was. It was a 3T. Um, you know, we have a 127 megabytes or megahertz for hydrogen. Uh, so this is just all header information it gleaned from the DICOM and is now um, relisted in this JSON format. Um, the matrix acquisition 256. Um, slice thickness 0.1. I mean, this was a 3D acquisition. Um, so oh, I don't have a cell anymore. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's sort of what the DCM to bids did. Let's look at our functional data. Oh, let's make this bigger. So let's look at this JSON file. Uh, a lot more information. Uh, this is that task name rest that I included. Um, probably because the first time I read bids validator, it told me I needed that. It tells me what phase encoding direction this was. Um, so there's J or negative J. I think there's also uh, I and the other <laughs> letter, if you were to have uh, acquired in that direction, which is pretty rare. Um, echo planar imaging. Okay. 
So um, at this stage, we're ready to run fMRI prep. I haven't uh, talked too much about fMRI prep, so maybe let's go to the website. So this is um, their website. This is tells you how to install it, how to um, use it in a Docker or Singularity, which is what they recommend. We are going to be using Singularity. Have you talked about Singularity during? OK, great. Um, usage notes, as you can see, you have a lot of options. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, I, I highly recommend going through uh, all of these. It tries to explain uh, what each one does. It's not always the most, um, it's not always the best at explaining what it does, but there is an online community that is also confused that try to help each other out. Um, it tells you uh, what steps fMRI prep does, um, which is very long, I'm not gonna cover it all, but we will look at the boilerplate that it creates. Um, so I'll show you that. And it also explains uh, what the outputs are. Um, so yeah, so I, I definitely recommend going to that website. Um, again, it's gonna be in our uh, markdown file that you're gonna have access to. Okay, so um, we've converted DICOM to nifty and bids format. Uh, we've run bids validator, we're, which fMRI prep wants all our data in the bids format. Um, this is one extra step that you wouldn't have to do at home, but we have to do on the high computing, high performance computing cluster. What is it? High performance cluster yeah. computing? Um, and which is because on the nodes, they don't have access to the internet and fMRI prep uh, will call, uh, we'll try to download a file. We're going to have to download it ourselves, and then, um, and then tell Singularity where to look for it. Um, so that's pretty much what these lines of codes are doing. Uh, you know, we're going to tell it uh, where we're putting the template flow uh, directory. We're going to install template flow with pip. And then we're going to tell uh, template flow what to download. And so these are different, um, essentially um, normalized uh, spaces that fMRI prep uses in order to get uh, the subjects all in a shared um, a shared space, let's say. Okay, so. And those templates, that's kind of like data that will use to normalize it against? Yes. Let's see you have infant. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so, yeah, so actually in fMRI prep, you can tell it, um, I think it's always going to um, use uh, an MNI which is the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, template, which is um, used a lot in uh, MRI processing. Um, but if you want to then um, get it to um, get it into another space, I think there's a field you can pass it. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find it live right now. It should be templater. Uh, no. Output spaces. Um, so you can tell it uh, which template, what resolution, and which cohort. So uh, within template flow, uh, where was that? Um, you know, this pediatric one is going to have different age cohorts and different resolutions. And so you can tell it what you want it to do. So, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's all pretty. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot to, uh, to know and do. Where is, there should be a description somewhere of all the templates and, uh, I don't know if this is the one either. This doesn't look very good. Sorry guys, I, uh, don't have it on the tip of my finger where to look, where to find this. Um, but yeah, okay. So just looking at the time, I'm just gonna try to um, move ahead here. So we're gonna wanna load Singularity because that's what we're gonna run fMRI prep.
Oh, probably just uh, maybe I just need to load a specific kind. Oh, <laughs> what's the um, how do you load just like the basic? Uh, <laughs> None of us can remember. I think it's. I don't think you need to show that. I think we can just kind of continue through. Or do you do you need to build the image? Um, no, we don't necessarily have to do it. I feel like I have it somewhere. So. Maybe you start with module load GCC. Nice. All right. Crisis averted. Um, okay. So um, before we can run fMRI prep, we need to install its uh, singularity image. Um, so we're going to call singularity singularity build. Um, Don't make the same mistake. Um, yeah, so I would then call it fMRI prep. And then, you know, I've already done this, so that's why I'm able to kind of just show you that. So, anyways, you want to put it somewhere that you're going to be able to call it from and then tell it where to download from. So in this case, it's my preps, fMRI prep. And you can tell it which version. I think this is the most recent one. Again, I'm not going to run this. Um, but so after we've done that, we're now ready to run fMRI prep. And uh, so fMRI prep is very um, resource intensive. So we're, we're definitely going to want to create um, a PBS bash script. So if you remember when we created the bid scaffold, we made a little code folder. You don't have to keep your code here, but I, I kind of like it. Um, so I've already written this uh, PBS file. So let's look inside it. So it should be very similar to what I have over here. Um, I'm telling it how long uh, to run for or how long before it terminates. Um, four nodes, 32 CPUs, 48 gigabytes. I'm not sure that that's uh, the most optimum or efficient. So, you know, don't, don't, or take this with a grain of salt. What it'll be called, my user, what's ABE stand for? Job, get a mail, job reports, to get the rest. Right. <laughs> but ABE is usually what most people want. Yeah, abort, begin. Abort, begin, end. Okay. Um, this is uh, the email address. Please don't use mine, uh, but it's going to tell you when it starts and it's going to tell you, you're, it's going to email you when it ends. Uh, you probably want to name these output and error text files a little bit more, uh, you know, specifically than the way I've named them here. But okay, so here is the meat of it. So within the node, you need to reload all the modules. You know, don't expect it to know which module. So module load singularity, change into the PBS work directory. Here, I'm telling um, Singularity where to find template flow. So um, this is that template flow that we downloaded. So that's really important. Otherwise, it's going to crash because it's going to try to get connect to the internet. And then this is one, essentially one line that I've used uh, backslash to break up. So we do Singularity run, clean the environment, tell it where the home directory is. So I'm running this from my bids directory. Um, we're going to also tell it uh, where the derivatives folder is, where the main folder is, um, where the singularity image is. Uh, in fMRI prep, if I just want to run one subject, I have to pass participant label. I have to give it the FreeSurfer license. FreeSurfer is free, but you need to download its license. I think it's 
probably for funding reasons so that the people who wrote it can uh, show how many people are using it um, in order to get funding and stuff. And then the last lines are essentially like, what is the main directory? What is the output directory, which we've defined up here? And then we want to run at participant level because there is also group level. If you've run this already on all the participants, you can then do a group analysis um, that should give you some you know, quality control information, like who is an outlier in terms of uh, data quality. So we're going to extend on professor. And Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Let's. So if we go to Free Surfer, you can just Google it um, or any of your other. Yeah, it's it's pretty. I mean, you you could probably lie and just add in anything you want here, but um, <laughs> you. Yeah. 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 So I have actually had to do this multiple times because I keep, you know, losing my. No, no, no. You'd only have to do it once. You just have to keep that license. I mean, the text file is pretty generic. Like we could all share it. Um, again, I think it's just for their purposes of trying to keep track of how many people are using it. So um, it's not totally understandable why they would want want that. Um, so in or okay, so now that I've written I've written this out to a Q sub file. I have my bash shebang up here and my uh, PBS information. Um, I can go ahead and run it. So. I would do Q sub, tell it where it's uh, where it is, um, and then I would run it. Uh, I guess I could run this. Oh, jeez. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? I think I must have just uh, purged too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Sorry, guys. Um, what's a better way to clear a module? Module unload? Module remove. Module remove. Okay, I'll try to do that. Um, so if I went back to my scratch space, which I have an alias for, so people at home won't be able to do that, but essentially just CD scratch uh, your scratch space. Um, I can go back into that folder I created with the bids and I can run QSub code. Okay, so then right now it's just queued up. Let's check on that. Um, so here um, it's currently, where does it say queued up? Oh, that was fast. Um, how do we kill it? Dell. Dell? Yeah. And then the, just the number of three nine nine one three eight zero. Oh, just one L. Got it. Oh, Q delete maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's going to take some time to run. Most of the time that it takes to run is actually coming from FreeSurfer and a lot of the anatomical uh, processing that it has to do. Um, but uh, so after it's done, it's going to be in this derivatives folder. And um, so I just want to show you uh, all the processing that's done. It has, it's put it into different folders. So anatomy, um, it's given us a lot, uh, but essentially brain mask. It's put it into MNI space. <clears throat> it's uh, done some segmentation, good stuff like that. And the functional folder, um, again, it's moved it into MNI space. Um, we have two sets here because there was two fMRI resting state scans that I had. Um, so essentially, if you only had one, this is what you would have. Uh, these are 
or sorry, these are confounds that it finds. So you can use these to remove uh, nuisance regressors. Um, or if you run fMRI prep with aroma, which is like an automatic detection uh, tool, uh, you could also use those regressors and remove those. We have a brain mask and we have a pre-processed bold. So I have already moved that over um, to my home computer so I can show you guys. Um, so this is the, after it's run, this is sort of the summary information it gives you. Um, it uh, tells you what it's done with the, you know, um, creating a brain mask and tissue segmentation. So we should have white matter, gray matter identified. So you, this is, these are what you want to be checking. This is, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, essentially, so that skull stripping I was saying, it's, um, it's uh, trying to identify what's brain and what's not brain. So you kind of want to look at these outlines and be like, oh, yeah, this looks like it's identified brain pretty well. This is uh, registering the anatomical to the um, shared space. Um, surface reconstruction. Um, this is, you know, what FreeSurfer does. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, again, more segmentation and um, Gray matter folding. I think I've run this wrong here. Um, it's a, it's a, it's definitely identified the, the uh, susceptibility correctly, but it, I don't think it ends up running it. So I may have just run something wrong when I ran it. So now this is the alignment of the functional to the anatomical, because the, again, the functional is so poor resolution, you can't just directly try to register that to the shared space. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, I mean, this one is the frame-wise displacement. So this is essentially motion. These are other um, metrics that kind of tell you the data quality. This is a carpet plot. Um, if the subject moved too much, there's, you know, you'll have like, you want this to look pretty much random. Um, anyways, there's a lot of information here. Uh, so I ran aroma in one of these runs. And so this is anything in red, it's essentially saying should be thrown out. Uh, and anything in green, it's it's saying uh, is likely from neuronal activation. Um, it gives you this methods uh, printout, so it tells you everything it's done, and you it recommends that you would copy paste this in your publication, and actually copy paste. Be be oh, wow. oh yeah, it's a because it's a, a, a second. Copy and paste this to their manuscript unchanged. It is released under the CC0 license, public domain dedication or whatever. Um, and the reason is, uh, I mean, essentially they're saying this is exactly what was run. If you try to write your own methods, you might get it wrong and you want everything, you know, you want people to be able to copy what you did. No errors to report. That's nice. And so that's gonna be specific, if you come back to this. Yeah. This is gonna be specific to the parameters that you yeah. set. So yeah, that yeah. Yeah. I wonder if this ever flags on like. Uh, I don't think so. Like, I mean, this has been no. I don't think so. I think just because of that Creative Commons, and it's what they recommend. I mean. Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, that was fMRI prep. Um. Once we've run this, though, all we've done is, you know, the beginning that we've cleaned up our data. We don't yet have. We haven't done like an fMRI analysis, so I um I won't have time to show you that. Uh, nor I mean, no, nor did I prepare that. That's just a that's a whole other thing. There's no standardized way to do that. Um, so it would definitely be depending on what your question is. Um, so I still have ten minutes. I don't know if I want to take questions, uh, or if you guys want to see some more like kind of um other processing of fMRI. Um, I mean, it's, it's going to be in this markdown. And I'm showing you two ways to remove nuisance. So if you ran aroma, you would run all these steps um, to remove what it automatically identified as noise. Um, if you want to try to um, remove components that fMRI prep um, sort of identifies, 
using the segmentation. So like, for instance, if you want to get rid of um, signal within the um, cerebral spinal fluid um, and, you know, frame-wise displacement, stuff like that. Um, so let me just show you that real quick. So without running aroma, uh, we have this confounds time series. Uh, rest AP run one. Yeah. TSV. So TSV is a tab separated variable. Okay, so these are all the columns. And these numbers down here are just gonna be the time series for each of these columns. And so if you want to try to remove um, the time series that is identified as frame-wise displacement, um, it has um, you know, transverse motion in the Z direction, rotation in the X direction, so on and so forth. Uh, you can tell it which column names uh, to remove. High pass filter, low pass filter, um, this TSV file to pass into it. Um, so this is using a program called Run Denoise, which is a Python library. And this, I show you here how to install that. Um, some fMRI images uh, within the first couple images have not reached steady state. Um, so you might want to remove those. So using FSL, and again, you would have to load the FSL module. Uh, you can remove those. Essentially, this is telling uh, where to start and the index is zero. So if I want to start at the 10th one, I would write a nine and then negative one means go to the end. Um, so this would remove the first 10 uh, time points. Smooth, um, typically, in the fMRI world, you will end up smoothing your data because uh, if you want to better compare across subjects, um, this is likely something that you'll want to do. OK. The last thing I want to show is uh, how to download data from an open repository. So this open neuro is, is one such. I mean, there's, there's many. Um, so I previously found one that I wanted to use for this um, tutorial. And again, this is going to be in bids format, as you'd expect anything in open MRI to be. Um, and so if you want to download this onto uh, Sockeye, obviously you can't do that in the node. You have to do it um, first in the login. Uh, I show you how to do that using um, Amazon Web Services. So all this stuff here is just how to, uh, this is a, another version of a virtual environment, but this time it's in Conda. And we're installing and loading Amazon Web Services. And then we run Amazon Web Services and we tell it what to download. So just want to point out, if you find you know, an open database you want to download, you would um, find its ID number. And then on Amazon Web Services, you would tell it uh, where to find it and then where to put it. And so um, right here, this is just a PBS. Again, I've run Singularity, but this time I've run it on this, um, this other data I downloaded. Um, and you wouldn't have to do DCM to bids because it's already in bids format. Um, yeah, that's it for um, fMRI prep and fMRI and Sockeye for this session. The next session, I'm going to go back, talk about T1, T2 waiting, because we're going to talk about FreeSurfer and running FreeSurfer. Um, and then we'll also cover DTI. Uh, and I'm going to run it. It's going to be really similar, um, both in the sense that DTI is also T2 star weighted. It also uses echoplanar imaging, so it has a lot of the same um, pre-processing that needs to be done. Uh, but I'll talk about the theory of DTI, and I will uh, also run another standardized um, singularity uh, uh, pipeline called a QSI prep 
and that's that'll be for DTI pre-processing. So in five minutes, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I feel like I went pretty fast at the end. It's okay, I think you know a lot of people are probably just learning. The thing. <laughs> And ask those questions. Maybe I just ask one, and uh, if nobody has questions on Zoom, then I will ask the next two. So the first is that this after MRI preparations, they show the green thing that is good, and the red is maybe has too much noise, right? May I ask how do they discriminate the whether the image has any noise or is good or not? Yeah. So, um, what you're meant, what you're referring to. Yeah, so oh, yeah, sir. You, Good point. Sorry. You show that my MRI relations has some, some C1, C2 has green signal, which is good, but some of them has a red signal, some noise there to make it too much noise. And uh, how do they know the image has enough noise or not good enough to be green? Um, so it's using this program called Aroma, which is trying to do automatic removal of motion artifacts. Um, and it's not, it's not even necessarily the best. Um, I would say that probably the best thing that you would want to do is run something called ICA fix. Yeah. And the idea is that um, probably one of the best ways is to manually look at all the components um, that ICA has. Sorry, there's, I mean, there's a lot to cover, but no, 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 but, but, uh, but so Aroma is supposed to be this automatic method, um, but I mean, you know, uh, how, how good is it actually at looking at like all the different vendors and all the different, um, you know, like children versus adults and stuff like that. So uh, probably what you would want to do is run something called ICA fix. Mm -hmm. And I think that's from FSL. And what you do is you train, you create a training file where you manually find what you yourself think is noise versus neuronal signal in like, let's say 25 subjects. Mm -hmm. And then you, um, so essentially you teach it, like these are the ones that are noise, these are the ones that are um, neuronal. And then you can then run it on the hundreds of subjects that you have using that trained one that you've created mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, so in this case, the training set, the, the software already know what kind of pattern is good and what, what kind of pattern is noise, so they can describe. Right, right, right. Oh, okay. That's the idea. Okay. And so I'm right here, I'm just sharing this. This is the paper that is based off. So if you want to read um, what, uh, how it's done. Are they getting into uh, deep learning or? These sorts of like signal removal. I, or yeah, education. yeah, I think so. I'm not sure if this was done with deep learning. No, I, think, this looks like linear I think ICA fix. I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, deep learning is a huge field right now in MRI with both its uh, caveats and and but yeah, I mean, it it seems to be everywhere. Um, but definitely this identification of noise versus um, signal is is a is a huge subfield within fMRI. And definitely shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, okay, great. Let's. <laughs> no questions on Zoom. Do you want to keep asking? Yeah, of course. Yeah. If nobody on the Zoom, maybe. I would... So you show that you can choose, but about aroma, and noise, the smooth, and the smooth maybe from FSL is kind of things that can remove the bad signals or something like that. And uh, what's the difference between the three things? Um, sorry, what's... What? So it's aroma and uh, smooth and the denoise. Denoiser and the oh. kind of things that generate this cranial, which is good, which is bad, right? But, 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 but you know, what's the difference? Because because they are three things and we run separately, so I guess they are not the same. But... Uh, yeah, I, sorry, I, I do think there's some things that are going to confuse. So um, aroma is one way to automatically detect. Um, oh, this yeah. fMRI prep also um, using segmentation and stuff tries to detect um, what is what is noise and, and whatever. So these are these are two options for what to remove. So they are the same. Or the same? They're similar but different. Oh, similar. <laughs> and so that's why that's why fMRI prep doesn't do it itself because um, it 
really can't make that decision for the researcher of like how they actually want to, what method they want to use. And so ICA fix is another one that I didn't mention here. You can just remove them yourself by looking at each component and being like, yes, no, but that would be very time consuming if you had hundreds of subjects. Um, this is a, is a separate thing altogether. So okay. this remove first time 10 time points. Okay. You may not have to do this based on uh, how you've acquired your data because it some scanners already throw away the first 10 time points. Okay. Because just the first 10 time points, the scanner is not stable or the machine is not ready. Uh, yeah, it has to do with how we detect the signal and it, it hasn't um, got, um, come into steady state. Um, so this would you would be running this after removing your nuisance regression. Uh, smoothing is also something you would do after and it's just for group comparisons. Yeah. Okay, but it's, uh, it's 11 now so I'm going to uh, end this here and we're going to start again in an hour and we'll do the free surfer and DTI.